So, so on behalf of uh, Jawaharlal Nehru Planetarium and ICTS, I extend a warm welcome to all of you who have assembled here and those who are who have joined us online uh, on the YouTube channels. So we extend a warm welcome to you. So it looks like after a long uh, period of hibernation, we are back and to see people one another in person. And it's as though we had a long pupil stage and now the adult butterfly has metamorphosed. And uh, hope that uh, in the coming weeks and in the coming months, um, more and more people will turn out in, in person here uh, for this program, Copy with Curiosity. So today uh, uh, we have a Professor uh, uh, M.K. Matthew from NCBS. Uh, he recently retired from NCBS and he will be speaking uh, on coping with salt and drought, how crop plants survive. So Professor M.K. Matthew, his connection with planetarium is more than two and a half decades. So in the initial stages when planetarium had these uh, education programs coming up and we made some of the programs uh, uh, formal ones, especially the, uh, one which is the flagship program of the planetarium known as uh, REAP, Research Education Advancement Program, uh, conducted for undergraduate students who are interested in a career in science, especially research and teaching. Uh, so during these formative years, Professor Matthew played a key role, and it is with uh, great fondness that we recall his association with the planetarium. And uh, he has taught here on several occasions. So in a way, it's a sort of homecoming for him that he is back at the planetarium venue to give this uh, copy with curiosity talk. I now request uh, Professor uh, Joseph Samuel to uh, say a few words about ICTS and uh, formally introduce the speaker, so Professor Joseph Samuel. Thank you, Madhusudan. Yelargu Hartika Swagata. A hearty welcome to a copy with curiosity. Perhaps you can come over to the front. You can, cannot see very much. Those at the back. This event is hosted by the Planetarium and ICTS Bangalore. Let me say a few words about the ICTS. The campus is near Shivkote village, near Hesargata. The ICTS is the center of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Bombay just like the NCBS that Matthew was working in. The ICTS functions in three different modes, like other research institutes. It is engaged in scientific research, in advanced scientific research and teaching. A new dimension at ICTS is that it organizes scientific programs, workshops, and meetings to serve the research community, both national and international. And another important dimension of the activities of ICTS is outreach, of which this copy is an important component. A recent initiative is the Math Circle, which seeks to nurture young mathematical talent. Please check our website for more information about the Math Circle initiative and the Math Challenge. Our speaker today is M.K. Matthew from the National Center of Biological Sciences. Matthew's research interests are in transmembrane proteins. These are proteins that span the cell wall and regulate the passage of substances across the cell membrane. His lab has developed a model that best explains the data which is available on this topic. And they've studied potassium channels in the heart and found that the stresses affect the, the electrical properties of the transfer. His research work also includes the topic of today's talk, how do plants cope with adversity in the form of salt or lack of water. So Matthew did his master's in chemistry at IIT Delhi and his PhD in biochemistry at the ISC. In his college days, he had many diverse interests. He was a skilled basketball player and he was also involved in dramatics and he, dramatics, he put up a play, I mean, he was, uh, it's a mono act, the play by Thomas Beckett, 
which is called Crap's Last Tapes. And I'm sure that you'll see his varied skills in effect today. So without further delay, Matthew, let's hear from you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sam. It's uh, <coughs> not many people are aware of uh, one's activities as an undergraduate. It's a it's a problem, <coughs> occupational hazard, when you meet up with people as ancient as you, <laughs> Sam. Um, but it's a it's a it's it's a very real pleasure being back here. I have taught here many times and it's been it's always been a very interactive process you know it, it's not just somebody giving a lecture and people listening to it and I do hope you guys will keep up the tradition yeah that is if you find that I'm going too fast if I'm using terms that you don't understand stop me yeah there's yeah, there's there's no point in my keeping on going if, if I'm not understood by everybody out here. Yeah. So, <clears throat> talking about uh, this business of salt and drought, and the reason for doing that is, you know, you hear a lot about all this climate change business and stuff like that. And it really comes down to our ability to feed a growing population with decreasing farmland. And the farmland is decreasing in part because cities are expanding and gobbling up fertile farmland. That's part of it. But another part of it is drought and salinity. So the drought you understand, it's fairly straightforward. Yeah? You, you see things like this. <coughs> Every year we hear we had a normal monsoon. What that means is that the country as a whole got about as much rain as it usually does. Yeah? But it does not mean that every part got the normal amount of rain. Yeah? Some parts got flooded, other parts didn't get any rain at all, and it ended up looking like this. And if this happens for several years in a row, you've got severe drought crops don't grow there because crops need water. Yeah. So that's easy to understand. But why would you say that there is an issue with salt? And salt is actually a really major issue. Between salt and drought, these are the two major factors which reduce the amount of crop productivity worldwide, not just in India, but worldwide. And this is a plot of areas in across the globe that was seriously affected by salt. This is 2011, this map. Yeah. But the, there's at least about 20% of all arable lands are affected. And Bloomwald and Grover, about 15 years ago, estimated that 50% of all the land that was currently under irrigation would be, or, or actually cultivate 50% of all land that was under cultivation, not just under irrigation. 50% of all land that is under cultivation would be affected by salt. And you wonder, how come? And what's happening out here? Yeah. So there's a number of reasons. Yeah. So one reason is entirely human driven. In the old days, you know, like for instance, when the Romans beat Hannibal, yeah, and they wanted to make sure that there would never be another such attack. What they did was they sowed salt into the fields yeah, of their enemies so that those fields could never be used for growing crops again. Yeah. So this is, this is a known and ancient way of essentially wiping out civilizations. Yeah. But it's not only people who are doing this. Yeah. <clears throat> 
there's a number of mechanisms by which fields become salty. Yeah, and I won't, I don't have the time to go into all of them. I'll just give you one. See, you're irrigating these fields. Yeah? So that water comes from a river. That river came down a mountain. And in the process of coming down the mountain, it broke up a whole bunch of rocks. It eroded them. It's in the process of eroding, eroding them. Some of those pieces of rock ended up as nice rounded pebbles, which you'd like to play with. Others broke into even smaller pieces and ended up as sand. But the soluble portion remained in the water. It was dissolved. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> you take this water and you spread it over your field because you want to water your crops, yeah, which is good. But now think of what happens to that water. A good part of it evaporates. Another part of it, a significant part of it, becomes this is water and carbon dioxide. Yeah? Most of you is water and carbon dioxide. It started out as plants, yeah? but that's, that's what it is, right? So that's part of the water. <clears throat> and there's a lot of water which passes through the plant and gets transpired, goes off into the atmosphere. Bottom line, nearly all the water which you're using for irrigation goes away. But the salts don't go away. They stay there. Yeah? <clears throat> River water is not very salty. You can drink it. Yeah? It doesn't feel, it's not as salty as the sea, but there is some salt in it. And over years, decades, maybe centuries, yeah, the salt builds up to the point where plants can no longer grow. Yeah. And this is happening everywhere. That's what they're talking about here. Yeah. But and, and so you might say, ah, this is a modern problem and we, we, we should find solutions to it. We should find solution to it, but it's not a modern problem. Yeah? This is a problem which affected the first big cities ever. The first big settlements big enough to be called cities. That's the cities of Ur and Uruk in uh, Mesopotamia. They practiced intensive agriculture, irrigated their fields, and were able to sustain fairly large populations. And they ate wheat. But over a period of time, their fields became a little saline. You could no longer grow wheat there. So they switched to barley. Barley is a lot more tolerant of salt. Over time, too salty for barley, the cities had to disperse, and the civilization collapsed. Yeah? And that made way for Babylon. Yeah? And the rest you know, is literally history. You must have studied it yeah, at some stage. Yeah. So this is an old, old problem. This is published in several places, yes. So the, this is, uh, sorry, as far as I know, that's the first publication. But there have been several publications since. You can't prove it, of course. What you can show is that there was this transition from wheat to barley over a time course which paralleled salinization of that land. And the conclusion that the, those authors draw is that this is what led to abandoning of those cities in due course. Yes. We'll talk about that. Yeah. <clears throat> this happened over centuries. Yeah. Uh, what we are doing now, because we are irrigating on a much larger scale, is it's happening over decades. Yeah. So it's it's only a matter of how fast it's happening, but it's it's something. So this is a a six thousand year old problem. Yeah. And you asked about whether there are methods of countering it by using, by developing crops that can withstand salt. And that would be what I would call the medium term solution. Yeah. The long term solution would be some way of re soil remediation. And we don't know how you're going to do that. But at least in the medium term, you would like to develop crops that can grow here. The good news, if you want to call it good news, 
The good news is that we've been doing this not just over the last 30 or 40 years, yeah, where you have nice terms like biotechnology and crop breeding and things like that. This has been going on for at least 12,000 years. Yeah? And the, the, first <coughs> the first bit of breeding was really domesticating plants. Yeah? So that's, that's wild rice. This is the variety of rice. The, 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 this variety of rice is one that was domesticated. And this is one of the cultivated varieties. So really what happened was that these were growing, and they still grow, in marshland. Yeah. So these are aquatic yeah. <clears throat> in shallow waters. So they don't need to stand upright. They're supported by the water. And when seeds form, they get dispersed in the water, as in when they form. Yeah. So they're not suitable for growing for agriculture because, A, they don't stand upright, they don't, they don't have as much seed, and they don't, the seeds are not stable. As soon as the seed forms, it falls out. You, you need them to be stabilized so that you can harvest them and then release this, the seeds by some process of threshing and so forth. Yeah? Uh, so all of that was what the early, I don't know what you want to call them. They were not even farmers in those days, but the folks that were in the process of playing around, collecting grains and so forth, selected plants that actually stood upright and could be grown in areas other than marshland, and then selected plants which actually set the grain nicely, and so forth, until you got plants that look like this. Yes? No, there's a f perfectly natural. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The the irrigation part is of course man man made. Yeah. That the 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 early e e the. What happens normally is that you have floodplains. Yeah? That's where agriculture started anyway. Yeah? But those floodplains get so much water washing out the salts which are getting deposited that there is no persistence of the salt which is there, very little. Yeah? It's when you are irrigating land which is a little far away from the river that you no longer have, unless you have adequate rainfall to, to wash it out, and by definition, you probably don't. That's why you're irrigating it in the first place. Yeah? So, <laughs> but there are other mechanisms which are not human-induced, which also cause salinization. I shouldn't leave you with the impression that salt is an exclusively human-induced phenomenon. Yeah. <clears throat> right. So you can see what these biotechnologists or plant breeders or what have you did they took these plants, which, which were uh, aquatic and which couldn't stand, and got them to stiffen up their stems so that they could stand upright. And in the process, when they stood upright, they also made pods for the seeds, because it's the same material, lignin, which strengthens the, the stems so that they can stand upright and also form these sort of pods so that the seeds don't shatter and go away. So it so turned out that both of these went hand in hand. Yeah. And so initially, rice actually got domesticated three times. Yeah. Once in Asia, and after it was do domesticated, probably around the Yangtze. Yeah. Uh, that variety then got split into the Japonica variety, which is grown in Japan and China, and the indica variety, which is grown here. Yeah. But it was also domesticated in Africa. And recently, there's been evidence that it was also domesticated in South America. But when the Europeans went there, they essentially destroyed their rice granaries. And so the domesticated South, Af South American pool disappeared. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> but three times is 
most unusual. No other plant has been domesticated more than once. So the idea is that you can have, people have been doing this. Yeah? So you say, you know, you're moving genes around, it's not a good thing. Yeah? We've been doing it for thousands of years, tens of thousands, at least 10,000 years. Yeah? So you need to be a little careful when you're using terminology like that in terms of saying, what's, what are we doing which is different? And we'll talk about developing varieties that might be able to survive salt. And when we're talking about how do you persuade crop plants, and we talk about rice mainly because that's what I work on, but the same is true of wheat or barley or sugarcane for that matter, yeah, any of these. <clears throat> how do you persuade these guys to be able to grow in land which has got a lot of salt in it or in land which has got limited water? And one way would be to look at plants that are adapted to living there. Look at cacti, for instance, and say, those are the kind of approaches that you need to use. But the thing is that those are extreme. And it's very unlikely that we'll be able to get a wheat plant to adopt the kind of strategies that a cactus has. Yeah? <clears throat> or this is, this is what happens in mangrove plants. Yeah? Mangroves, many of these plants have got salt hairs. So salt goes up, all the salt is separated out, pumped into these salt hairs, and the salt hairs drop off. So <clears throat> the plant itself is, not, is only transiently <laughs> exposed to all this. <laughs> yeah. uh, and we, again, these are tricks which we are unlikely to be able to teach rice or wheat to do. So we really want to look at rice, wheat, and ask, are there varieties which are able to cope with salt and uh, salinity? And it turns out that there are, because you know, although agriculture originated on these river plains, people moved out, and the plants moved out with them. And they developed varieties that were able to cope with whatever they were growing. You know, if they went up in the hills, there were crops which grew in the hills. They selected and they did their plant breeding. And uh, so this is just to show you that rice is actually very sensitive to salt. But we have a lot of varieties of rice. Yeah. So in the Northeast, for instance, this is just a small sample of the number of different varieties <coughs> of rice which are grown in the Northeast. Yeah. And forget the rest of the country. So you have rice which is growing in the coastal regions, which gets flooded with seawater every now and then, in, in the backwaters in Kerala, for instance. Yeah. You have rice which grows near the deserts, which is able, or you have wheat which grows in the deserts, yeah, which are able to deal with drought, in effect. Yeah. So you might want to ask the questions, how do those varieties, which might be a little bit different from those that you use, you know, the Green Revolution varieties that we are using, What's the difference between these two? And is it possible for you to teach the Green Revolution varieties to do what these guys who are the, the hardier varieties do? Yeah. So that's something that we wanted to look at. And so we chose a variety. Now we were looking only at salt. Yeah. We chose a variety <coughs> which is Pokali, this, this blue star. Yeah. Pokali grows around the backwaters in Kerala. Every now and then gets flooded with seawater, survives it well. Yeah. Yield is not great, but some of us like the red grains, the red rice, others don't. That's a different, that's a different issue. But the fact is that you can go up to, th this is the salt that we used when we were testing to see, we were choosing a variety which could grow in fairly salty water. Yeah, and Pokali survives pretty well up to there, well, IR20, and IR20 is one of these high-yielding varieties. It was developed at the International Rice Research Institute. Yeah, it's a, it grows maybe about 10 times as much as what was grown prior to the IR8 and the IR20s were introduced. So this was something that we wanted to compare it to, and we see that there's a tremendous difference between the two in terms of their ability to deal with salt. Yeah? So the first question that we asked is 
is there a difference in the way they handle sodium? You know, yeah, the, the main problem, okay, there's two main problems with when you are growing plants and the soil has got a lot of salt. And for salt, <coughs> let's take it as sodium chloride to begin with, yeah? If there's a lot of salt, there's an osmotic problem. See, the way that the roots take up fluid is because there's a difference in osmotic pressure between the cytosol and the roots and the medium out there. Yeah? So it will go from a region where the salts or whatever the is, is high to one where it's low. Yeah, I mean, sorry, the other way around. Yeah, it will go towards the re region which is more concentrated in salts. Basically, water will go from um, the place where it is at a higher concentration to a place where it is at a lower concentration. So if the outside is very salty, that means the water concentration there is low compared to the water concentration in the cytosol, yeah? So water will go out of the cytosol and into the soil rather than the other way around. And the whole purpose of the roots is to take up fluid from the outside, fluid, minerals, goodies, yeah? And send it up into the shoots. Can't do that if the outside is high concentration in salts and small molecular weight. Yeah. The other problem is that if salt goes in, some ions the plant doesn't mind, some ions like sodium are actually toxic to the plant. Yeah. It can tolerate modest amounts of sodium, but high sodium in the cytosol, whether it's in plants or in animal cells or in bacterial cells, not good. Among other things, it will disrupt your ability to make protein. You know, your protein synthesis machinery uses potassium. Sodium will try and displace that potassium. You won't make protein. Everything shuts down. Yeah. Lots of other things happen. But basically, too much sodium in the cytosol, not good. Yeah. So you want to avoid that. Yeah. Something else. In, in humans, you're regulating the external fluid that's in your, in your plasma. And there, it's a matter of how, your, how well your kidneys are functioning. So usually, if you see an imbalance, it's because your kidneys are doing the job correctly. <clears throat> but the problem, the, in, in effect, yeah, the problem because you've got high sodium and low potassium, as the case might be, will be similar. Okay, right? So what we did was we said, let's look at how the coastal variety, that's Pokali, yeah? Um, and we'll compare it against IR20. There's a bunch of others that we have studied. But, and labs all over the world have used different high-yielding varieties. But Pokali, turns out, is the gold standard for surviving in salt, yeah? So everybody uses Pokali. So... <coughs> And all kinds of sophisticated research has been done, looking at genes being expressed here, not being expressed there, and so forth. My lab was not authorized to do any genetic engineering on plants, so we decided to do something much simpler. We just asked, let's grow these plants in high or moderate salt, yeah, and see whether they handle sodium differently. Yeah. And it turned out <coughs> that IR20 or Jaya uh, no, we didn't, I, I didn't put in that data because it's very complicated. Bottom line is, you put it in moderate salt, Pokali, no sodium in the shoots. Yeah? It's, it's as though you're growing it in regular, you know, ideal conditions. Yeah? Jaya or IR20, lots of sodium in the shoot. Yeah? So we said, ah, What's happening is that these plants are not able to distinguish and select the sodium and potassium, not discriminate between them when they're sending the fluid up because the root's job is to collect fluid. It should collect some nutrients also. You know, some manganese, magnesium, calcium, all these things also from the soil and send it up into the shoot. And if you're not able to distinguish between sodium and potassium, too much sodium is going up. That's the bottom. That's what's happening. So we wanted to, yeah. So 
So these were germinated in plain water separately. And then we put them in at, I think, two weeks of age. We put them in, this is hydroponics. So we just put them in 100 millimolar or whatever the concentration there is. And we saw how long it took. I think we looked only for a day or two days for this particular experiment. Different experiments, we took different lengths of time. Yeah. So we let them grow till there were some, some length, uh, some substantial amounts that we could look, and then we subjected them. To, yeah. Yeah. The accumulation of sodium becomes lethal. So there's no question of subsequent generations. Right? I mean, if, if there's too much sodium, the plants stop growing. And in due course, they die. So I'll show you one place where we did that, not at concentrations which were high enough to be lethal, but at sublethal concentrations. And we'll show you what happens in that in that condition. <clears throat> so to understand what's happening in going up into the shoot, so here's, here's the uh, route, OK? So there's two ways in which fluid can go in. You, this is a root hair. So fluid can enter the root hair directly. And there are connections from cell to cell. And it can go from cell to cell to cell and reach these xylem vessels which go up into the chute. And that fluid can go all the way up. <clears throat> but there's another path. There's gaps between cells in the root. And these gaps are there so that the external fluid can enter and bathe all of these cells out there. So you're effectively increasing the surface area that root cells have to abstract goodies from the outside. Yeah? So this is, this is going along in the interstices between cells, but you don't want that to go directly up to the chute. Yeah? Because you want, to, you want the good stuff to go and the bad stuff to be retained. Yeah? So there's a, a barrier here. Yeah? There's a barrier. This is a wax barrier, which prevents this fluid from going directly into the chute. Now, at this point, it has to enter the cell. Yeah? And as it crosses that cell membrane, there's all kinds of selectivity that comes in. It takes the good stuff, leaves the bad stuff, and then you pass it on to the xylem vessels, and it goes up. <clears throat> when we sent our paper up uh, for, to be published, it got reviewed by somebody who'd been in the field for a long time. I, I think I know who it is, and he's really been, at that time, he must have been in his early 80s. Yeah. And he pointed out that about 30 years before, people had looked at these barriers and found that in rice, these barriers are not too good. Yeah. There are occasionally gaps in these barriers. Yeah. So here's, so, so we started looking at those barriers. These yellow things, this is a stain which stains for that wax. Yeah, it's basically a wax which prevents water from going through. Yeah. And you expect that this would be continuous, but you can see that here this isn't continuous. And so at these points, water can actually come through. So we call this bypassing the barrier. Okay? So we call it bypass flow. <clears throat> and it turned out that in, if we looked at this, that this is the amount of this Wax, it's a molecule called subarin. So what's plotted over here is the amount of subarin. Yeah. And that's the amount of sodium that's going through by bypassing that barrier. And you can see that IR20 has very little subarin, and it allows a lot of sodium to pass through. And Pokali, which has rather good barriers, allows much less sodium to go through. And that's what we saw, that in the shoots, there was very little sodium in Pokali and much more sodium in the case of IR20. Yeah. <clears throat> now, what we did was we did an experiment where we varied this. Uh, 
we like varying things. Yeah, I mean, that's what we do as scientists. Yeah. Once you find a phenomenon, you'd like to see how far does this work? Can we manipulate this a little bit here? Can we manipulate this a little bit there? But the bottom line here is that if you extrapolate these two, these are two very different sets of experiments. What you see is that the amount of shoot sodium yeah, corresponds to the amount of bypass flow. So if you have very little of this bypass flow, that is, if you have good barriers, very little sodium will go up into the shoot and your, and your plant will survive. So one of the ways that you would like to use to limit the amount of sodium toxicity is to build these barriers in the root. Yeah. So <clears throat> somebody asked as to what would happen, I think Mother than you asked the question, right? What happens if you grow the plant and then the next generation, what happens? We've never done that, but what we did was we took these plants and we subjected them to a week of salt stress, very mild salt stress, not enough to kill them, but enough for them to feel uncomfortable. Yeah. And at the end of that, <coughs> this is what we saw. What we see is that even IR20 makes these barriers and makes a lot of those barriers. In fact, this amount of the barrier is much better than what Pokali started out being. Yeah. <coughs> It's exactly the same condition, except this is done under the same conditions as that. The difference is that in between, we subjected them to a little salt. Yeah. So we, 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 we made life a little hard for them yeah. and toughened them, so to speak. So we call it conditioning. Yeah. So <clears throat> two things here. We do not recommend you putting salt into your fields yeah, to toughen up the guys that are growing. Yeah, what people are trying to do now is to understand how does the plant detect that there is salt yeah? in order for it to turn on the mechanism to make these waxy barriers. Yeah? <clears throat> there are people who are working on it in Germany and in France in particular. I presume there are people working elsewhere as well. And the idea is if you can figure out how that is detected, and then transduced <coughs> into making these salty barriers, these waxy barriers, maybe you can develop a small molecule that you can spray onto the plant, and it will be persuaded, it will think that it's been exposed to salt, and it will start making these barriers. The other good thing is that you don't need to make a transgenic plant. Yeah, we didn't make a transgenic plant here. Yeah? This is the same plant as that. Yeah? So the genes are there <clears throat> in the process of making the high yielding green revolution varieties. What has been chosen for is that the energy that the plant was expending on defense, in this case, defense against salt. In other cases, it might be defense against drought. In another case, it might be defense against a certain kind of moth or a caterpillar. Yeah? You turn off those genes because they take energy. Yeah? So you're no longer protected against those problems, but you're protecting them in your field. Yeah? So they give you good yield. But the genes are there. And if the time comes when you need them to be turned on, it's possible for you to do so if you can figure out how to switch them on. No, 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 that's not what we did. No. This is, a, this is just a curve drawn to guide the eye. Separate experiments? They're separate experiments. Okay, so this, that was the question. So, what I was trying to ask was if you start with the same concentration as the test, the per units that you have on the acceptance, is it the same response? So, all the experiments are done under the same condition. Uh, these two in parallel? These two in parallel. Yeah. And using the same conditions. So I'm not showing any of that data. The potassium levels are maintained very well. They don't change significantly over any of this. So yes, because you're adding sodium to the outside. 
the potassium remains constant. Yeah. But in the wild, what happens is that if you add more and more potassium, yeah, I mean more and more sodium, the sodium displaces the potassium in both in the uptake system and in the cytosol when, once it gets there. Right. So <clears throat> this is all very well, and we've figured out a whole bunch of other mechanisms that plants use. These are whole plant mechanisms. I mean, it's the root going up into the shoot. <clears throat> and there's labs all over the world that have characterized genes which are responsible. In some cases, they don't know what the genes do, but they know that the genes are, res you know, if these genes are expressed, then the plant is able to survive. If those genes are expressed, it's not so good. So all, all of that information is out there. We asked another simple question, which is, that's at the whole plant level, very good. Do you see anything, do individual cells in the plant, are they able to survive high salt? Yeah. The barrier itself? The subarin is the barrier. That is the barrier. Yes. Oh, the subarin concentration we estimate by extracting it. Yeah. So we use some solvents and we extract it and we measure it separately. And that reaches the barrier. It's two. The barrier. Effectiveness, we estimate by seeing how much sodium goes through. Yeah. And the subarin, we can estimate by extracting it. <coughs> and we can see the pattern by the microscopy that I showed you. And all these three correlate. So it's a, it's a correlation. It's a correlation. I'm, I, I, sorry, I, I projected it as causative. We think it's causative. But strictly speaking, it's correlation. Yeah, so we wanted to ask as to whether single cells, you know, from these plants, can they also uh, survive salt? So what you see over here is rice cells. We've stained them with a dye which has different fluorescence properties when it binds sodium to when it is free of sodium. Yeah? So by taking these images, yeah, we can estimate what the sodium concentration is. Uh, <clears throat> are there physics folks out here? Physicists other than Sam? Yeah, okay. Okay, for the cognition, this image, we, had to, we could not use a regular microscope and using the light to excite this because you needed to go into the UV and microscopes have got glass uh, lenses. Yeah, UV doesn't go through them particularly effectively. So we had to use two photon excitation. So we actually excited them with an IR, with IR photons. It's a little tricky, the experiment. But <clears throat> doable experiment, OK? So when we do that, this, these are pictures where what's plotted over here is the sodium concentration at each pixel, OK? We can, <clears throat> we can actually measure <coughs> the sodium concentration at each pixel. And what you can see is that here, this is Jaya, which is like IR20, which is also sensitive. Yeah. <coughs> when it's unstressed, there's very little sodium, Pokali also. <coughs> but by the time you get to about 100 millimolar sodium, that's mild sodium. Yeah. You've got significant amount of sodium in the cytosol. Yeah. When you get to 150, these cells are dying. In fact, some of them are probably dead. So these. This is measured within about 20 minutes after they've been put into this high salt. These guys all die. Whereas Pokali, you can go to much higher concentration, 250 millimolar, happy. Yeah? No significant amount of sodium in the cytosol. We can grow this for months. The cells will divide. They divide very slowly. Yeah? They don't, they're not, I said happy, but they're not happy. <laughs> yeah? Yeah? <clears throat> but they survive and they grow. And you can, we could grow them for several months. And at the end of that time, there was still no sodium inside. Right? So if you plot that, in Jaya, the sodium went in, wasn't able to keep the sodium out. Pokali was able to keep the sodium out very effectively you know, over a range which goes almost out to seawater. And that's needed because it gets flooded with seawater every now and then. You know? 
<coughs> so we asked, how does this come about? All right, oh, this is, this is, this is just neat. Right? See, in all the textbooks, it says, if sodium gets into the cytosol, the cells die. Yeah? But there was no direct measure which could measure sodium in the cytosol and also monitor if the cell was dying. Yeah. So here now we've got this dye inside. We could measure the sodium and you could measure the viability of the cells. Very good correlation out there. Yeah. So this is textbook statements which you could verify. It's no big deal. It's well known, but it's a fun experiment, so we did it. Yeah. Most of what we do are fun experiments. We do them because you, know, you can do it. It gives you an answer. Sometimes it's an answer which everybody knows, but nobody's been able to show. Sometimes it's an answer which nobody knows and nobody expected, and that would be even more interesting. Yeah. So we do things just yeah, to have a fun. All right, but this is an experiment. What we're doing over here is we're monitoring how fast sodium comes in. Right? That's the rate of sodium entry. This is sodium entry <coughs> when you step up the sodium in the medium. <coughs> and this is Jaya. That's Pokali. Yeah. And you can see sodium goes in very fast into Jaya. That means the permeability of the plasma membrane for sodium is high. Yeah. And sodium is able to get in very quickly. The permeability of the plasma membrane for sodium is very low in Pokali. Now, we estimate the permeability here to be pretty much the same as what has been reported using radioactive tracers in wheat and barley, beetroot, whole bunch of plants. Yeah? It's in that range. This is at the low end of what people have reported for mangrove plants. This more than an order of magnitude difference never been reported before for any one species and I'm afraid I have to confess to you that we don't know why. I mean, we've looked, we've, we've tested various hypotheses. People have written to us suggesting it could be this, it could be that, we've tested it. Nothing that we've tried works. Yeah, so we can tell you lots of things that it is not, but we cannot tell you why, what, what underlies this, this, this difference. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is, this is minutes. Oh, no, no, no. This is a very artificial experiment. Okay? This is a very artificial experiment. We have isolated the cells, and we've suddenly dumped a lot of salt and we are asking how fast it goes in. Normally what would happen is that there, this would be a gradual process. All of those things will happen. Now we don't know as to whether if you did this very gradually or if you did the same kind of experiment we did before, that is you, you stressed the plant for a while, would these cells become like that? We don't know because we tried to do that experiment but for technical reasons we were not able to do that experiment. Yeah, so the, the point at which Pokali cells die in terms of the sodium in the cytosol is much the same as for Jaya. But the Pokali is able to withstand higher external sodium very effectively. That's the difference. It means that you can grow them in practically in seawater and the sodium does not go into the cytosol. Whereas if you take Jaya or IR20, the sodium goes into the cytosol, the cells die. Okay, right? So we don't know how this plasma membrane sodium permeability is affected, but we do know that some of the sodium that comes in gets accumulated in this large vacuole that plants have. And we suspect, or we, we've hypothesized, that now once you've got sodium which is in this vacuole, you'll have to dump it out. Yeah, and we suspect that the way that works is that you make little vesicles which then go out 
to the margin of the cell and dump out the fluid. Yeah? So that's dumping out the salt. But in that process, you're depleting <coughs> material out here, and that has to be made up by more material coming in from the external medium. And to test that, we just put in a dye. Yeah? And uh, we can see that the dye goes in very slowly in control, goes in much more rapidly under stress. We've studied this much more rigorously. I can't show you the data. The data is, it's, it's, it's a little complicated to explain, that's all. Yeah, but basically, what happens is that uh, the Arabidopsis root, we are now not going away from rice to Arabidopsis because it's more tractable. The Arabidopsis root is thin and it's trans almost translucent. So you can actually view all the layers of the root. And we asked as to whether <coughs> we could find evidence for something like this. So we found that vesicles do go in and out and that all our data explain the mechanisms by which they operate in the Arabidopsis root. And so the picture now is that not only does Pokali limit the amount of sodium that comes in, but it uses something like this and regulates this mechanism that we have not been able to establish either. Yeah? So that this, this flux going through is also accelerated and that also we have not been able to do. Yeah? So that's, that's this picture. Now I talked about drought and we haven't really mentioned drought so far. Yeah? And <clears throat> we'll get to that in a moment. Remember that water is taken up yeah, in the soil by the roots by the difference in osmotic pressure. So if you don't have <coughs> material in the root cells, in the root cytosol, at a concentration higher than what it is in the medium, then the direction of water flow will be from the root to the soil rather than the other way around. So if you want to get root material taken up, you better put in stuff into the root cytosol. Yeah? So we call them osmolites, small molecules which you make in plenty and you put them in. Yeah, and then we have, here we said that there is a control which is exerted in choosing what goes up. And there <coughs> you have water which is released to the atmosphere. So we looked at, here's our friend Pokali again. There's IR20 and Jaya which are sensitive. <coughs> but you'll see one more character here. That's BI33. BI33 <coughs> is a rice variety which was developed by a colleague of mine in the University of Agricultural Sciences called Professor Shashidhar. And the idea there is that he bred for drought tolerance. Yeah? So this is a variety which he can grow pretty much like wheat. So he's got experimental plots where he's got a row of wheat, BI-33 rice. Wheat, BI-33 rice. And it grows perfectly well. It's been, the variety has been released in northern Karnataka, and it's doing very well. Why is that important? <coughs> it's very important because the way we traditionally grow rice, it takes 5,000 liters of water for one kilo of grain. Yeah? And you know that this may not be sustainable. Yeah, water is getting to be increasingly precious. In course of time, you may not be able to afford 5,000 liters for a grain, for a kilo of grain. Yeah. So varieties like BI-33, other people have developed other varieties. Yeah. These do well with considerably less water. It's not that it, you know, you can't grow it at Rajasthan in the desert, but you can grow it like you grow wheat in a regular field. Yeah. So, but he's a plant breeder. So he can manage to choose. So it's like, uh, you know, like the guys who started with the original domestication and ended up with all these varieties that we live with. Yeah? They, they've succeeded. They've succeeded brilliantly yeah, in getting you varieties that are able to feed you and me. Yeah? They don't necessarily understand how it is that those plants do what they do. Right? Yeah? So it's a job of physiologists such as myself to try and figure out how this works. And we said, OK, let's look at BI-33. So, so we figured out some things in BI-33. I would not go into that because of shortage of time. But the other thing that we've decided that we'd ask is there's BI-33 and Pokali, one of which is, you know, does well in salt, the other which does well in drought. How about if we 
mix things up. How do they do, how does Pokali do in drought and how does BI-33 do in salt? So what this shows you is that BI-33 in salt does pretty well, actually, yeah? These two guys are dying. BI-33 is doing well. Yeah? You do this, do the reverse. You grow Pokali in, uh, under drought and Pokali does pretty well too. And the way it works is that it's all root. It's these, you know, those waxy layers. They, they rearrange themselves. And again, I don't have the time to explain why this works. This is all root hydraulics and a certain amount of fluid mechanics which comes into it. But basically, the, the arrangement of those waxy barriers is optimized when you have very little water and you want the water to go up easily versus when you want to prevent water from growing easily and you want to select the salt. Yeah? So here's something that happens. This is the osmotic adjustment. This is, this is how much you osmolite you make and you put into the root cells in order to be able to abstract water, uh, fluid. Yeah? And this is the amount of sodium that goes in. And you can see that Pokali actually makes a lot of this osmotic, osmoticum out there. BI-33 also makes a lot. So that's how they're able to get salt, I mean, get fluid when water is limiting because salt stress is also water limitation cell stress effectively, yeah? In both of these cases, it's able to abstract water even under conditions where that's difficult to do using this. And that by means that we don't really understand at the moment is correlated also with the ability to distinguish between sodium and other things. But how does it get to water in the first place? The way it gets to water in the first place is that both BI-33 and Pokali make very long routes. So effectively, this is a, a strategy that we call water mining. Yeah? You're mining for water, you're going deep, going about two meters down, and hoping that down there, there'll be some water that you can, that you can tap into, and quite often it works. Yeah? If it doesn't work, the plant dies, unfortunately. Yeah? But quite often it works. But there's a problem with doing that, yeah? And the problem is that when you go down, yeah, there's no oxygen. If, if you go under, underground, oxygen levels fall. And root cells are like any other cells, they need oxygen. Yeah, so you need to get oxygen down there. So what these plants do is, this is the root at 30 centimeters below the surface. And you can see it's full of cells. By the time you get to 50 centimeters or a meter down, you can see there are big gaps out there. And these gaps are essentially conduits through which air from the surface can go down to the tips of the roots. And those roots can then have adequate oxygen to survive. These are cross sections. These are cross sections. Yeah. yeah. Now, there's still a, <laughs> there's yet another problem. See, plants are smart because they have to deal with a lot of problems. Okay? So there's another problem, which is oxygen is a gas. It diffuses very nicely. Yeah? You have this, the oxygen would diffuse out of there and get out into the soil. It would never reach two meters down. Yeah? So what the plants do is that they build, just like these barriers out here, they build barriers out there, wax. Okay? Oxygen does not permeate through that wax. So the oxygen that enters from the shoot out here cannot diffuse out over there, comes all the way down, supplies oxygen to all the cells around there, and then finally goes out at the bottom over here. In, in Pokali and BI-33, yes. Otherwise, they don't build those barriers. Yes, yes. Like I said, plants are smart. Yeah. Oh, you're not getting in water here. There's no water here, remember? It's only down here that there's water. Yeah, this, this is a region where you don't have water. It's, the plant was unable to get water from this la these layers. It had to go down this deep in order to mine water. Yeah, water would not be able to get it. Yeah. 
Little, little louder, please. Nothing special. Trees do exactly the same thing. They use the same molecules also. Well, they don't use exactly the same molecules. What, what they do is they put more lignin. You know, it's the, the, the tree roots are quite woody, many of them. But in principle, it's the same thing. And the lignin is also a relative of this, this wax for that matter. All right. <clears throat> Yeah, so they, yeah, that's true. These also, to a fair extent, also. These don't go, normally they don't go that deep. The roots don't go that deep, but they spread out and they support the, the plant. Yeah. Uh, and of course, the tree roots spread out much further because they've got to support much more weight. So we asked a, yet another question, mainly because we could, which, which is, yeah, um, that we split the roots. We let the plants grow for about a month, and then we split the root and we put them into two separate. So you can see these two pots have got slightly different, they've got soil, but we can put water in one and salt in the other. We can water this guy and not water that guy, and we can ask what happens to the roots. Yeah, you've got part of the root. Yeah, so here's when the roots are getting water on both sides. Here's water on the left and salt on the right. Yeah, and you can see that Pokali does pretty well with salt on the right. BI-33 does so-so eh, with salt. But these guys, this does not do well at all. Jaya does surprisingly well with the salt. And so these are things that one would like to ask. How does the plant decide half the roots I'm going to pay attention to and lavish nutrients, let this grow, and the other half, eh, you know, deal with it, deal with it yourself somehow, whatever it is, yeah? Um, <clears throat> there are many mechanisms. I only talked about one or two of them, yeah? There are many, many mechanisms. Do they, do, does a plant turn everything on at the same time? Does it turn on one at a time, depending on how bad the situation is? And if so, how does it choose which one it turns on? We don't know the answers to those questions, yeah? But <clears throat> someone or the other is going to figure that out. All right. I should end by acknowledging all the people who did all the work that uh, you know, made those pretty pictures and so forth. I had a large number of students and postdocs in NCBS, Veena, Panaga, Sam, Kavita, Anirban, Shraddha, Rukaya, <coughs> Shruti, Divya, and Snigdha. And we are, NCBS is located on the campus of the University of Agricultural Sciences. So all these people were students of the University of Agricultural Sciences who did their work in my lab. <clears throat> they did their PhDs or their masters as the case might be. Yeah. And we also had help from people in other institutions, Utpal Nath in ISC, Luca Schreiber in, in Bonn, yeah, uh, Kalika Prasad in Isa yeah, and others, uh, in Aki Nakano and his group in the University of Tokyo. But the biggest acknowledgement has to go to the people at the University of Agricultural Sciences because at the time I started working with plants, I had absolutely no background in plants. <clears throat> okay, I did a master's in chemistry and whatever biology I have learned is by reading textbooks, yeah, which serves, you can get by. Plants are a little more complicated. Yeah. <laughs> There's only so much that you can learn by going through textbooks. And I used to go to the crop physiology department in the University of Agricultural Sciences and bug uh, Uday Kumar and the two Shashidhars, and they would always explain what was going on. You know, sufficient so that <coughs> one is able to design experiments and then they help with the facility. Question. So uh, thanks, uh, Professor, for. Uh, great presentation. Uh, I understood quite a bit, though I am absolutely not from biology, uh, forget botany, right? But um, uh, one question that comes to my mind uh, from my general reading is that these uh, different varieties that you showed for rice, 
right? They have some genetic origin, right? Some genes are responsible for Pokali to be the one uh, behaving like this versus the other. Now, obviously, uh, whether CRISPR-like technology, right, where uh, you just do some uh, genetic modification to achieve whatever is the desired result has been tried in this crop part. People, people are trying that. Okay. <coughs> what I'm saying, what, what, what I showed you is that that may not be required for the specific instances that we looked at. That is in terms of making the waxy barriers. That, the genes are already there. It's only a matter of turning them on or off. You may be able to use CRISPR to do it. It may be more economical to just figure out how to switch them on or off. What, can you explain briefly how they switch it on and off? I mean, because I know it's... Uh, yeah. yeah. So basically you have, all the cells in your body have got the same genetic makeup. The DNA is the same. Yeah. But a skin cell expresses certain genes. Your eye cells express a different set of genes. So there are regulatory mechanisms which decide which genes are turned on in which tissue and which cell type. And if you can figure out what those regulatory mechanisms are, and usually these involve some small molecules. Not, there are proteins, of course, <clears throat> but at some stage there might be a small molecule involved somewhere. And if you can throw in that small molecule, you can switch things around. There's a question at the back. Welcome. Ah, <laughs> okay. I don't know about growth rate per se, right? But let me let me give you a very different analogy. I I think of Pokali as being like one of these medieval knights who've got all that armor. Right? Because they've got, yeah, they're protected. You can whack at them with swords and axes and nothing happens to them, yeah? The other guys have not got all that armor, but they're much more agile and they can devote the energy which was, which Pukali uses to build that armor to make grain. And that's the, that's the trade-off. Now, can you persuade these guys to make a little bit of armor? Not, not the whole lot just a little bit of armor that protects the critical part which is affected under salt or the part which is affected under drought. That is difficult to figure out, but in principle, because we've shown that the genes are still there. Yeah? So if you can figure out how to switch, how, how those switches work, we might be able to do the job. Uh, I have a question here. Yeah. So uh, as you said that the BR variety, which was drought resistant, yeah. Uh, survive well in salt. So did the uh, Pokali survive in drought rations as well, like with low water concentration? Yes, yes, very much so. We were surprised, okay? We, we did not expect that something which had clearly been bred to deal with a specific challenge would do very well under a different specific challenge. Turns out they both do very well in, the, in these different challenges. So, so is there any correlation between drought resistance and uh, salt, uh, means more salt concentration? Like in one side there's low water concentration and one side... They're both uh, water stress conditions, bottom line. They're different kinds of water stress conditions. But drought does not necessarily mean salt. I mean, although there's less, less water, it doesn't mean that the salt concentration goes up in those, in those areas. So has this been seen in uh, crops other than rice? Uh, other uh, such like uh, wheat or other, okay, wheat does not require that much water, but maybe other crops. I don't know of any, of any studies in wheat or barley looking at this. Both of them have been looked at in terms of salt, but I don't know of people who have looked at, you know, correspondingly in terms of drought. Thank you. You no, no, no. I knew a new questioner. Yes. It's about genetic modification. Yeah. Do plants have DNA? 
Yes, very okay. much so. They've got DNA just like you. Okay. So, and can um, touch me not plants survive salt? Can they? I don't know how much salt they can survive. Okay. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I don't really know. Okay. But but okay. no people know how huh? how they shrivel up when you touch them. Oh yes, I've done it once in school. Yeah, but yeah. once I saw I saw it in a tropical forest. I've seen it in a rainforest. I've even seen it in a desert desert area. So yeah. I think they can survive a bit of salt. They if they probably, can survive, they probably can. Huh. There was, uh, but but I don't know of anybody who's done the experiment huh. and seen how much salt they can survive. But I'll tell you a different cool experiment that somebody yes. did. This was done by students who were doing a BTEC in electrical engineering in one of these colleges here in Bangalore. So <clears throat> they said, since touch me nots have this very quick response you know, when, when they're touched, can they be used to detect infiltration? That is people coming in across a border. Yeah. Wow. So could you plant them all along the border and have some <laughs> electrodes in them and uh, detect? And what we saw was that when you touched the touch me not plant, you could detect electrical signals. JC Bose has done this experiment a long time ago. We were not, these guys are not the first guys to do it. What they were trying to do was to make a very simple thing with just using pins stuck into the, stuck into the stems of the uh, plant and then put that in, into an array so that you could then tell which plant had been touched. And the problem they came up with, can you, tell, can you think of what, what might be a problem here? Let's say everything works, yeah? That they're able to detect which plant is giving a signal. Can you tell me what, what could be a problem? Is there a way that a plant can give a response without some nasty guy tripping over it? Yeah. Yes? Yeah? Like how? Well, it could be it could be a dog, yeah? It could be a strong wind. It could be an insect. insect. It could be a plant-eating animal. So what, what would happen, and in fact they set up this thing, you know, they could detect that plants had been touched, but they could not detect as to who touched it. Yeah. So they were trying to make this a project for the defense. Well, that's what they were looking for. That somebody who was trying to sneak across the border might step on the plant, yeah? And that would be detected. Yeah, we know that uh, plants uh, have this well-established chemical communication across individual, individual plants. Yeah. So when one particular plant is under uh, salt stress, so would there be this development of these barriers in other plants, even though they are not exposed to ah. much of this. Ah, yeah, yeah. So this is, this is a question. I, I don't know the answer for, for salt. Yeah. Uh, I don't know of anybody who's done the experiment for salt or drought. And I suspect the reason for that is that all the plants in the area would feel the salt and the drought at the same time. So there's no need for one plant to tell its neighbor that, look, it's salty out here. In control conditions when you're doing this in the lab? No, so, so nobody has looked for it because in the wild it would not be particularly useful. But if an insect comes and feeds on a plant, right? So that plant quickly develops some, some defenses. Some of it is chemical. This leaf that's being chewed on, it makes nasty stuff so that the insect that's chewing on it gets a bad taste. It might also be toxic. So the insect dies. It takes a little while, but it does that. Other leaves on the same plant also start doing the same. So they're signaling within the plant to leaves that have not yet been chewed on so that they start making these things before insects come. Because this guy might be 
a harboring of other insects coming. Yeah, could be a different guy coming there. What they also do is that they release volatile chemicals which go to other plants in the vicinity. And those plants start making uh, the, the same defense mechanisms. What they do, they, they do one step further, okay? What they do is they know that this insect which is biting them is food for another insect yeah, which does not bite them. So they release odors which will attract the enemy of my enemy. Yeah. So those predators will come and eat these guys. Why? Yes, but it's an arms race. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So it, it does work. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. But it's not over one generation, it's over many, many generations. Mm, well, it's probably many, many generations. Yeah, over those many generations, it, it's protective. By the time the insect comes up with something which can override this, the plant has to come up with something, something else. Yeah. So, but this is the current state of affairs. Earlier, there might have been a different set of molecules which might have done the same thing. There's a question online from yeah. Gayatri MP. So I'll read out the question and I'll rephrase it later. So new findings in the research, in this research of all the data available about salt stress of switch on and switch off by gene mapping. I'm guessing, is there a mapping available of which genes are turned on and turned off when you do these salt stress experiments? There is, several different people have done that. And those are available online. Good evening, Professor. So my question was, in your research, you have chosen Pokali and IR20 and Jaya as your uh, uh, samples, right? Was there any particular reason why you have chosen these among all the varieties of rice that are existing? Pokali is the gold standard. All right. All right. And it's locally available. It's just down the coast from us, easily available. And there's a Pokali rice research station whose you know, the scientists there are very cooperative, so they've, they let us have the seeds. No. Okay, on this, on the other hand, could this research conclude that in case there's any, uh, you know, shortage of water, of course there is, but in case there, there's any serious problem, then Pokali will emerge as the, uh, uh, you know, the solution uh, in case of serious uh, drought or issues in case like of, this? In case of increasing salinity, then it's, it's not just Pokali, there's a couple of, rice research institutes which have released by breeding. They've generated varieties which are a little more tolerant to salt than the parental varieties. Not as good as Pokali. Pokali was one of the parental strains that they used. So the varieties that they've developed are not as good as Pokali, but they're better than IR20. Or so they're trying to do that. Yeah. Uh, and one more question. So the land which we use for uh, uh, growing our crops, right? So farmers use pesticides and all these things. Will that also have an effect on the salt levels? Uh, not directly. Okay. Yeah. Pesticides, pesticides do a whole lot of nasty things. Okay. Yeah. And, but they don't necessarily generate salinity in the soil. All right. Unless you use them to such a high concentration that the amount of pesticide itself is a significant uh, you know, component of the salts in the soil. Okay. Thank you, Professor. The questions, comments? Uh, can one counter salinity by just adding some potassium salts to the soil? No, there's a... Uh, problem of osmolarity will then get much worse, right? Because you've added more potassium, which means that the osmolarity of the salts in the fluid around is now significantly higher than what it was before. So that contributes to the problem rather than ameliorating it. It will help in terms of not taking up so much sodium to some extent, yeah. but it, there's the counter problem. 
Uh, I have one more question. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you said that, uh, uh, I think I got that impression, I don't know if I'm correct, that IR20 has a uh, better yield of, uh, yeah. than uh, Pokali. Yes, yes, very so, much so, about 10 times. So uh, like if, uh, when we change the water stress, uh, does that have a direct impact on the yield? Like oh, we, we did not take the plants up to the point where there was grain yield. So I can't comment on that directly. But yes, it would be expected to, but we, did, we I can't say so with confidence in the sense that we didn't do the experiment. Thank you. So question, sorry. So uh, for Jaya, yeah. you said that they are also sensitive to salt, right? They are sort of intermediate. They're intermediate. not as bad as IR20 and not as good as Pokali. Okay. But in the two-pot experiment, Jaya did pretty well. That's what I saw. Yes, yes. Very interesting. So what, that was actually one of the expected results for us. Oh. Because we expected that Jaya was a generalist uh, that yeah. did not great in salt, not great in drought, but survived both. Overall balance. Overall well. balance, yeah. That's so that bad. was one thing which we said, ah, <laughs> something we anticipated worked. Almost everything else was unanticipated. <laughs> Thank you. There's a follow-up question from the same person online, Gayatri. Uh, I think she's asking, if you have these salt stress plants, they presumably accumulate compatible solutes? Yes. And so has this been analyzed in your research? Yes, yes, we have. We have. We have not gone to the extent of characterizing which compatible solutes. We've only done it in terms of total osmolite. Or total osmolite goes up significantly. And we've done mass spec, so we know that there's various components to it. We just haven't been able to, we haven't gone to the extent of characterizing which, os, which molecules they are. Any further questions? All right, so if not, let's thank Professor Matthew for a wonderful talk. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Stay safe and take care. Sorry, before we disperse, uh, Sam, there's a small gift from ICTS for Professor Matthew. Thank you, everyone.